Yes, it's me, Chipper, in name only, not in number. I have a doozy of an internet story to share with you today, so pay attention because it's gonna be super easy to get lost. Dramatis Personae 5, unclench your heart. Riley J. Dennis, YouTuber, tubing on trans issues, feminism, other LGBT stuff, and more recently, the coolest cartoon ever, Avatar The Last Airbender, with the best adaptation ever in the works. Make Avatar sexy. Okay, we're getting off topic. Over the last three to two years, Riley has made a couple of videos about biological sex that have gained a number of views. I don't know how many right now. JK Rowling, author of a mediocre mystery series and some other children's series with a character whose personality was wearing round glasses, decided to start interspersing tweets directed at children, praising them for her, her their fan art with ones where she was sharing misinforming articles about how psychiatrists are apparently indoctrinating children into becoming trans. She bravely reminded us that sex is real, which is a knowledge that will save the children, and if it doesn't, the gays will be oppressed again, which would be bad after Dumbledore saved the world. Exhibit 3. Lindsay Ellis, media studies YouTuber, has a master's degree in media studies, and has also become a published author of fiction herself. Was solicited by fans to give her opinion on how to separate art from the artist. Lindsay's video wasn't meant to address the scientific claims that JK Rowling was making, so for anybody who was interested in that side of the conversation, Lindsay directed the audience to Riley J. Dennis's channel to a couple of her videos, the ones that have a number of views, Exhibit Beard, Sargon of Akkad, noted spectacle of UKIP, longtime YouTuber, and perpetual defeater of Anita Sarkeesian in 2020. I wonder what's in her chromosomes that makes it so hard for her to be taken down. Not too long ago, Sargon posted a response video blowing these two bozos right out of the water. What, according to him, do they have to say about poor, harangued J.K. Rowling? Firstly, Riley believes that biology isn't real. Riley's trying to throw away the system just because it's not perfect. Riley herself is destroying these categories of male and female. The children and the women are going to be assaulted if we let <laughs> into change rooms. How are we gonna mate and have kids without sexual binarism? Lindsay Ellis is aiming for the purest of the pure form of death of the author, even though she's never been the purest of the pure. Of course, you and I are intellectually curious little buggers. We could settle with watching Sargon's video and nothing else, but wouldn't it be kind of fun to go over these people's channels and laugh at their clog-wearing buffoonery? Idiot pants. You fools! You think you can make a YouTube video? Oh god, where should we even start? How about this one, where Riley says biology isn't real? Biological sex has to undergo the same paradigm shift that gender did. We need to start thinking about it as a social construct rather than an inarguable fact. So if you're a trans woman, you're female. If you're a trans man, you're male. Oh, sorry, hang on, that must be the wrong one. Ah yes, trans YouTuber Riley Dennis, who doesn't believe in biological sex. Definitely not a fringe weirdo. Social construct. The two videos she is citing are specifically arguing that biological sex isn't real. Social constructs are real. There's something in the social sciences called the Thomas theorem which describes this idea. It goes, the things we define as real become real and their consequences. Yeah, that's, that's how it goes. Crimes are social constructs, but I don't think any of us would say that they're not real or that they're, I don't know, the same as a centaur or something. They have very material effects on the world. It's weird, because Riley says near the end of this video that she's often told by people that she doesn't believe biology's real or doesn't know what biology is. And somehow, Sargon makes the same assumption. I guess we're gonna have to explore this a little more. Can't we just talk about anime or something? I'll try to summarize Riley's videos here. Please remember though that you'll be able to find all the videos I've referenced as well as any additional readings linked in the description. Firstly, sex, not the things the category is composed of like chromosomes or genitals, but sex is really complicated, more so than it's popularly understood to be. A lot of people understand male and female as boxes, with criteria that have to be checked off in order to qualify as having one of those labels. But Riley makes the point that most people don't actually check off all those boxes. She subscribes to the view that sex is a spectrum. For those in the back, 
sex is real. Nobody's saying it's not real, but this model is a more nuanced way to describe all the various permutations of human sex. There are real consequences to people, especially medical professionals, not subscribing to the most robust scientific models of sex. Intersex people who make up at least, at least, 127 million people in the world, roughly the population of Japan, if we're underestimating, are sometimes subjected to medically unnecessary corrective surgeries as babies, as babies, to make their genitals look more normal. Secondly, trans people are sometimes denied life-saving treatment because of their doctor's perceptions and beliefs about, I don't know, prostates? One of the most famous examples of this is the case of Robert Eads, who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and denied treatment by no less than a dozen doctors because treating him would jeopardize the reputation of their practice. If someone walks into your office and fills out a form and checks M or F, you as a doctor are going to make some assumptions about them, and they are going to have to correct you to ensure that they get the best care possible. It's even possible that the M or F that's on their ID or health insurance doesn't match what's going on with them biologically. Lots of trans people transition medically or physically before going through any kind of legal process. So yeah, trans people can explain their whole situation every time they go to a doctor. They can explain that they're not really M or F and they might need care that's relevant to both. And the doctor can then try to help, assuming they're not a transphobic asshole. Or we could just ask people simple questions about their body and their health and then give care based on those questions. Do you have a prostate? Yes. Do you have breasts? Yes. Because we have otherwise yet to provide any evidence that JK Rowling is actually getting, physically getting, trans people hurt because of her belief that biological sex exists. Besides the dying from lack of treatment thing and the having your genitals mutilated thing, some people's feelings can be hurt. Lastly, cis people don't check in with each other's hormone levels or chromosomes before assuming the other person's sex. So why should trans people be forever deemed a sex that they don't identify as? The sexual binary serves neither a sociological nor scientific purpose besides causing ouchies. Some of you might think I'm splitting hairs here, but this is a recurring problem with Sargon's video. He warps the substance of the arguments he's dealing with, builds on his little fanfiction version of the argument, and then attributes that made-up thing to the one that Riley is actually taking ownership over? These arguments aren't the same at all, but a person who's already feeling emotional about the subject wouldn't care to understand why they're drastically different. Riley is not proposing a destruction of the old system, nor is she personally abolishing it. She's sharing scientists' attempt to refine it. There's general agreement in the scientific community that sex comes from what Sarah S. Richardson calls a choreography between all these different sex widgets. We have gonadal sex, chromosomal sex, hormonal sex, genital sex, sexual identity. Some even add on to that morphological sex, fertility, brain sex, sexual pref- SEXUAL PREFERENCE?! But Joanne! Richardson makes the same point that Riley J. Dennis makes. Namely, that if sex with a capital S is determined as being all or none, then a shit ton of people, not just trans and intersex people, but a lot of people who don't identify as trans and intersex, would be precluded from the sex that they were assigned at birth. For instance, you might have a penis, shit tons of testosterone, lots and lots of sperm, sperm just flying at your fingernails, the most typically male brain in the world. You might be a cis guy, you might be attracted to women. I mean, you might be Sargon of a Cod, basically. But with one caveat, you might have an extra X chromosome. This is called aneuploidy. It takes on many different forms. Sometimes people can have three X chromosomes and a Y, five X's, one X. Is the mere presence of a Y chromosome all that it would take for this person to be considered a man? Or is it the totality of his internal and external environment that allows him to move about the world as a man citizen? Here's another question. Is a person with one X and two Y chromosomes more male than somebody with just one Y chromosome? Plus there are all kinds of other things that contradict the assumption that sex is either or. If you have to be fertile with a certain combination of gonads, hormones, genitals, and chromosomes to be considered the sex that you identify with, what are the implications of this assertion towards women who are post-menopause, or people who are born infertile? What about cis women and trans men who have had double mastectomies and hysterectomies? I'm gesturing just in case you don't know what the words mean. What about men who have had mastectomies? 
What about people who alter their fertility using birth control? What about people who get fertility treatment when they're having trouble conceiving? Are they quantifiably less or more of their sex because these things have been altered by their environment? According to Sargon, it can feel that way. After going through menopause, some women feel like less of a woman. I think that this does exist on a spectrum, and I think losing your fertility does give you a hit to your maleness or your femaleness. And I think that's just a fact of life. It's not a very pleasant one, but it's just something that I think is true. And I think that people feel that. When women go through the menopause, I think they feel like less of a woman. When a man can't get an erection, I think I think he feels like less of a man. Wait, Sargon, you do believe that sex is a spectrum? Why are we even here today? <sighs> if that's true, then the rigid pop science conception of sex as a binary that Carl is insisting upon is only sufficient if we ignore all the points where it's not. If you have to check all of these boxes to be a certain sex, then how exactly is this framework accounting for people who do not check every single box? Are they just sexless, or are we putting everybody who doesn't fit into these two categories into a third box? In which case, are we saying there's three sexes, male, female, and other? To protect the feelings of hermaphrodites and anyone else who feels that they fall outside of the male-female binary, Riley has abolished this otherwise useful term that then brings on the further problem of how to legitimise male and female, and to solve this problem, she has abolished those as well. So now there is no male, there is no female, there are just humans with genitals, and they're all in the same category. Purely because some people might feel like they're being excluded and that it is hurtful. The word hermaphrodite is not the same as intersex. It's not the same, it doesn't mean the same thing. It's not interchangeable, that's why- Because there's a whole lot of diversity in this last box, I think we have to remember that. Not everybody who's intersex or people who don't fit into the fucking main two boxes are gonna have the exact same characteristics. Why does it make sense to consider trans women biological males if they don't tick some of the boxes in this category, especially if we're being absolutist and insist that they must check all of the boxes to be considered freaking males or females? What I just did there, you know, pointing out all the contradictions in pop science frameworks wherein sex is male and female is equaling female having babies with uterus juice is something that Sargon takes great issue with in his video. He says that they can destroy everything else that makes sex what it is. You can pump yourself full of hormones, but at the end of the day, you can't deny this one immutable fact. Chromosomes determine sex. They have argued that everything else doesn't exist, but chromosomes are the last piece in the puzzle that they can't make go away. And so Riley Dennis's conclusion is that chromosomes don't do anything. What purpose do they serve in differentiating people? The answer is, they serve no purpose. What purpose do they serve in differentiating people? Chromosomes don't do anything. What good does dividing people based on their chromosomes do? If chromosomes don't determine your hormones, secondary sex characteristics, genitals, or gonads, what purpose do they serve in differentiating people? The answer is, they serve no purpose. There's no reason to divide XX people and XY people. That is an arbitrary distinction that has no effect on how the person looks or behaves or navigates the world. But chromosomes are the last piece in the puzzle that they can't make go away. Interesting. Okay, so nothing else that we use to determine sex, like genitals, which is what doctors use to tell your, your parents what your sex is when you're born, actually matters. And the only thing that matters is the thing that you're born with, which is your chromosomes. In Carl's words, if you let nature take its course, then sex expresses itself binaristically. Except it literally doesn't. It doesn't make sense to talk about any part of biology without factoring in the environment. To say that this multitude of exceptions to this rule that isn't a rule is an example of nature not being allowed to take its course is the same as saying there's never any outside influences that, 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 that determine the fate of the species. And that's not true. However, if sex is, at the end of the day, only determined by the chromosomes, then I'd like to know something, Carl. If we gain the capacity, using gene therapy or something, to change a person's chromosomes and perform the big switcheroo on them, 
Would you still consider sex entirely chromosomal? I think this is an important question, because it's still possible that Carl's suggestions could be completely unseated by advances in science. And then we need to engage with the possibility that what we were calling science was actually feelings. Biology is a discipline for describing shit. It's not nature itself, it's a way that we approximate nature. And that means that it's subject to the scientific method. So if we test a hypothesis and we find out that it's wrong, then we change that hypothesis to try to get more accurate results. That doesn't mean that we're changing, like, New Mexico whiptail lizards or something. An all-female species? <laughs> Feminism? We're just ensuring that our system is doing the job that it's meant to do. Riley's thinking like a good science person does, and noticing that the previous hypothesis that we were working with was partially correct, but we have more evidence now that makes the picture a lot clearer. We're not throwing the whole thing out, we're just making it make more sense. Carl, you'll notice in that infographic that you were crying about earlier, she didn't get rid of the dots. Like, the dots are all still there, just the lines have changed. As you can see, she has taken away the criterion of male and female, the two boxes, and obliterated them. So now there is no male and female, and simply people with penises are on, uh, just generally on one side of a, a, a- Sargon says that Riley and Lindsay, by extension, are being perfectionists. He builds his entire thesis for this video off of that premise. What's actually happening here is Sargon is rigidly assigning weight and value to a blunted tool. This framework that he takes issue with will likely be changed or outright discarded at some point in the future, unless every biological scientist just, like, dies tomorrow or history ends today. It's a mistake to assume that we have all the answers. And what I like about Riley's worldview is that she's imaginative enough to be able to incorporate new evidence into it if she encounters it, and not assume that it can't be true just because it doesn't quite line up with her previous understanding of the world. Imaginative. Ima I don't understand how someone could misunderstand Riley unintentionally. They'd have to be highly biased. She's way more chill than I can manage to be, and she cites this whole paint swatch of sources, and Carl has the audacity to say that she's not being empirical. The only thing that he cites is his now-defunct merch store. That's kind of to be expected, isn't it? The British are empiricists, and Lindsay and Riley are arguing in the abstract about definitions. British culture is very focused around believing the evidence of one's own eyes. So I'm watching that Sargon video. He says that the Brits are empiricists, and do you want to know the how Brits he? Brits are empiricists. Yeah, do you want to know how he describes empiricism? How does he describe empiricism? Believing the evidence of one's own eyes. Believing things with your eyes. Yeah, that's empiricism. Is looking at a thing, and then believing what you're looking at. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> and Riley's not some fringe new age fucking weirdo either. The sexual binary has been disputed since it was proposed, according to Richardson again, and also Anne Fosto Sterling. And actually, Simone de Beauvoir will throw her in there too. Okay, if you're angrily typing a comment now saying, Sex is real, you stupid dumb face, let me ask you a question. What are my chromosomes? I'd like you to put that in the comments. Good luck with that. Now, Sug assumes the allure about two very important emergencies that will emerge if we moot the ways we spoot. <laughs> so, according to Carl, if we subscribe to the fascist Orwellian model of sex as a spectrum, we will fall into two cataclysmic events. One is that we won't be able to mate and have babies anymore, and two, bathroom assaults and women and children will never be safe ever again. Let's talk- that's- we're not gonna be able to recover the tone of this. Carl believes that people will lose the opportunity, or at least run the risk of losing the opportunity, of having biological children if we don't maintain the sexual binary. There's no time. I'll never make it. important to you to be able to make babies through penis and vagina pregnancy sex with your life partner, it's probably too important to discuss whether or not you can do that with them before you enter a Christian 
blood covenant contract that lasts forever with them. <coughs> Carl insists that you can't ask prospective partners if they're able to have biological children or you'll get canceled and it's all Riley J. Dennis's fault. But we all know here, you, me, and Milkis, that there's a difference between accosting strangers or acquaintances about their chromosomal or gonadal sex and talking to prospective life partners about potential deal breakers in your relationship. You know that, Carl. That said, until very recent developments in testing technologies and accepting some outlying examples like people who've had their genitals cut off or something, we're not usually able to just tell what a person's fertility is until we freaking do sex with them. Carl is kind of suggesting that cis people can just tell if their partner's fertile based on whether or not they're cis or trans. That's not true. Okay, and then there's this bathroom thing. Carl suggests that trans women being in bathrooms will, like, lead to the destruction of children and women safeguarding. It's a word that J.K. Rowling uses quite a lot in her hot mess of a blog post justifying her Twitter rampage. One thing that feminists have pushed back against since before feminism was a thing, like probably with Christine de Pizan in the 15th century, is essentialism about women generally, and about the assessment of people's capacities based on their biology. And yet, what's core to the TERF ideology is a complete inversion of this core feminist principle. TERFs view women as inherently weaker and femininity as something precious and delicate. Here's the big question. If trans women are biological males, so what? Sargon and JKR stop there, and they say that women and children aren't safe around males. What do you think they mean? Are they saying that all males are at risk of assaulting people? If that's the case, then we're clearly not focusing on the important issue here. Like, think about it. The guy who's been berating feminists for years for being man-haters still thinks that all males are potentially rapists, and the lady who thinks that she's a feminist is comfortable saying that females are weak and need to be protected. This is the real problem. If people like J.K. Rowling and Sargon really wanted to prevent assaults based on who's most likely to commit them, they would ban cis men from having any sort of relationships with literally anybody, including each other. Segregating things that way would be ridiculous, though. So there's a push to teach people what consent means and how to set boundaries. This isn't about safety, and it's not about protecting women. It's about space. Letting women and non-binary people exist in a space without question is just the same as legitimizing their existence in all spaces. There's no place in the world where trans people are entirely safe and won't be singled out, but we're not talking about that. Instead, we're talking about the potential dangers that trans people may, eventually, someday, pose to cis women. If we cared about stopping violence, we'd talk about where the violence comes from. Right now, we're talking about why the people who experience violence deserve it. TERFs and the people like them will never own to their beliefs. They won't tell you the truth. This is all a distraction, because there are people who can renovate public washrooms and won't give them floor to ceiling bathroom stalls. People can touch your shoes. Public washrooms in North America are a disgrace. Look at this bi-directional bidet. Loot both your shoes. The problem is I don't think most people who act in bad faith even realize they're doing it. I think most people have convinced themselves that they're curious, open-minded, critical thinkers. Unfortunately, this is something that transcends ideology, and I think that all we can really do is be aware of it on our ends. Um, okay, so how do we go to death of the author from bathroom safeguarding assaults? Uh, I don't know. So I'm just gonna show you a clip that I haven't edited from Sargon's video where he's trying to totally destroy a point that Lindsay Ellis makes in her video, so. Let's go. I personally believe that you can't really practice death of the author in its purest pure form. Once again, asserting the infallibilist position on the subject at hand. Why would we need to do anything in its purest pure form? What kind of standard is that? Like, what has, what has Lindsay Ellis ever done in her entire life that was of the purest pure- I don't blame anybody for getting confused when it comes to this media studies shit. I just started my master's degree in it, and I find it confusing too. That's totally fine. People usually say death of the author to refer to Roland Barthes' thingamajig, and in it, he was like, yo, fuck the people who make the art, the only people whose interpretations matter are the audiences. One of the big problems with Barthes' arguments, as Lindsay points out in her half an hour video essay on the topic, is that he's dealing in absolutes. Why would we need to do anything in its purest pure form? What kind of standard is that? You can't sever the connection between the text and the context that birthed it. Placenta, 
think about it. At the same time, Bald had a valuable point. A person brings their own biases and perspectives to bear on the text. You have to go both ways. It's important to remember that the author had their own biases and their own intent and agenda with the text. At the same time, though, the text lives beyond the author. Do you think Shakespeare could have anticipated the verse? So when it comes to Harry Potter, it's hard to maintain a pure, naive connection with the text once you begin to recognize some of the author's biases that snuck their way into the books. But it's almost impossible to figure out what to do about that. If we just stop talking about J.K. Rowling, well, we don't amplify her voice, sure, and she's so intricately woven into the fabric of our international multilingual society that if we just stopped talking about the problems with what she's saying, some people might not get the memo. How to reconcile your ethical framework with art that you used to love or still love is a complicated question with no clear solution. That's what Lindsay's getting at, and Carl got frustrated while she was listening and assumed that she was arguing that death of the author ought to be practiced in its purest pure form. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what else to say. She just wasn't. Maybe the bees got into Carl's ears again. This is not the first time this would have happened. When people act the way that Carl's doing here, it's a loss for everybody. There are way too many trans and intersex people who are denied the ability to live long, healthy, prosperous lives because some people believe they don't deserve the right to. And the way that we determine whether or not people deserve certain rights is based on an arbitrary system, and that's going to affect people that I care about, so it affects me. And I don't know what the solution is. I'm fucking such a dweebus. But I do know that misinformation pervades our Anglophone culture. Even when it comes to things that are supposedly fangless, and nobody ever bothers to check whether or not the things that people are providing as evidence to prove the creeds of these theories are true. And I, whenever I post a YouTube video, I just have a terrible panic attack. I don't know how Sargon's able to post 40 billion of them a week. Also, I don't know if you know this, but 1984 isn't the only book in the world. There's tons of books that aren't 1984, and that has nothing to do with what you're talking about. You can't just fucking say Big Brother every time you disagree with something. I know it's fun to laugh at Sargon of Akkad specifically, but let's try to learn something from him here. I think that's just a fact of life. It's not a very pleasant one, but it's just something that I think is true. Assuming that we can intuit the answers to really complicated questions is a mistake. Life experience is valuable, and I think that our brains are really good at convincing us that we know the answer because we may have seen it somewhere before. But it doesn't hurt to brush up on your reading and double check things and, you know, remember that you're not frickin' omniscient. Intuition feels very nice to act upon, but more often than not, it's not gonna serve you very well. <laughs> what I try to remind myself of is that I'm not coming to grips with most science and politics through doing science and doing politics. I'm coming to grips with it through media. And that's not a good thing if you're not used to or have never learned how to think critically. Now more than ever, it's crucial to think critically about the media that we consume, to fact check the things that we see online, and to scrutinize the messaging of the things that are easy to swallow. I have no way to recover the atmosphere I've established here, so um, let's just cut to footage of the credits. A huge thank you to my wonderful ass patrons who helped make this video emerge from the brain placenta it lived in. Thank you Femi, Josie the Riveter, Pat Healy, Sheldon W, Shreya G, and Thomas. I feel so much joy at the sight of your sweet little names flying out of my butt. 